Just so you know, this show is about scary stuff. So don't say I didn't warn you guys. And remember, don't be scared. Episode number 80, Trouble Bound. War Baby here with another episode of Murderous Minors. This episode does contain descriptions of physical abuse, sexual abuse, and child abuse, so please be aware. Recent developments in this murder case threw me back to one of my favorite shows ever, PBS Frontline. Episode 9 of the 2007 season is called When Kids Get Life, and one of the cases covered features Nathan Ibanez and Eric Jensen, and it's one of the sources I used for this installment of Murderous Minors, in addition to the Denver Post, Westward, and Rolling Stone. When 15-year-old Nathan Ibanez of Highlands Ranch, Colorado, joined a band with his friends Eric and Brett, It seemed like a welcome distraction from the things few knew were going on in his life. The new guitarist for the punk band Troublebound enjoyed having a sanctuary at his friend Eric Jensen's home, where the band spent their time rehearsing and where Nate seemed to spend as much time as he could. Hard partying, Porsche driving, Brett Baker met Nate first, and he was welcomed into the friend group and the band, becoming a common face around Eric Jensen's house in Littleton, Colorado. It was a more peaceful, less chaotic existence there than he could find at his house, where a troublesome relationship with his mother and an increasingly violent relationship with his father was developing into a full-blown nightmare. Through supporting their son, the bandmates' parents all became acquainted and Eric's mother began to notice things that were unsettling. She described how Nate's parents would fluctuate between thinking that Trouble Bound was a distraction from school, but then going to his shows and letting him practice. The Jensens also found it strange that Julie Ibanez would never let Nate stay over at the house, where Eric had an entire floor to himself of an extravagant home. She said that Julie had told her that she often followed Nate when he went out and recorded his phone conversations without his knowledge. Family members recalled that Julie was convinced that Satan was infiltrating her son's life through the company he kept and the music he listened to and played. Julie Ibanez had been born in Davenport, Iowa as Julia A. Toland, and Nate was born there as well on November 16, 1982. Before they came to Colorado, the family was excessively private and Nate remembers a childhood of forced familial isolation. His parents had moved him all around the world before settling in Colorado. His mother was an evangelical Christian whom Nate called unstable. She consciously tried to exert control over his life, he said, and the fact that his father had moved out only made Julie try to pull Nate closer. His greatest distraction came in the summer of 1997 with his entry into Trouble Bound and into a group of friends he finally felt knew him and who seemed to want to protect him from whatever had him so edgy and afraid. The teen ran away from home more than 10 times over the next nine months, beginning in the fall of 1997, his sophomore year at Highlands Ranch High School. His parents usually reported him missing, so when police located him, they simply returned him to their custody. On one occasion, after his father shook him awake and grabbed him by the throat, Nate escaped into the frigid night. He wore only a pair of jeans while sneaking through some woods and parking lots and neighborhoods to Brett Baker's house, with his father hot on his trail in his car. 
Upon arrival, Nathan breathlessly spilled the details of his home life, begging that they help him and the Bakers call the Douglas County Sheriff's Office. When they arrived, Rolling Stone reported that Nate was taken back to his parents and the Bakers were threatened with arrest should they continue to try and keep this child from his family. Another shocking incident took place after Nate called the police himself, telling the responding officer that he was, quote, unable to live at home with his parents, though he wouldn't give details about why he had run away. By that point, he'd been on the streets alone for two days. Nate requested that social services be called so they could find him somewhere else to live, but once again, he was returned to the custody of his parents. The Bakers and the Jensens had a meeting, which resulted in Eric's parents contacting social services, alleging that the response they received was something along the lines of, We don't have the resources to take care of teenage boys who should be able to take care of themselves. After Nate's mom and dad split up in the winter of 1997, Eric's mother recalled that Julie Ibanez followed her son to their home and shared information about her marital problems, saying that she was scared her husband was going to hurt their son. When they were considering reconciliation, Nate's mother even asked if he could stay at the Jensen's for his safety, even though she usually felt like her son's friends were influenced by Satan. Eric gained a bit more insight into what might have been going on behind the walls of the Ibanez home after he eavesdropped on a call between Nate and his mom. After Nate went to call his mom to see about spending the night, Eric and Brett later realized that he'd been gone for more than an hour. Eric told PBS Frontline that he overheard his friend talking to his mother in a childlike voice, saying over and over again that of course he loved her. Unnerved, Eric picked up on another line and listened in for at least 15 minutes of the hour-long conversation during which his friend uncomfortably reassured his mother. Nate never offered details about his relationship with his mother, never explained that when she was crying and upset, he would comfort her or that, quote, a few times that evolved into her doing sexual things to me that she shouldn't have been doing. I knew that it wasn't right, but I wasn't sure about my place in the whole area of what was going on with my family and the world in general. I'd been kept apart from a lot of outside things. The relentlessness of his home life ate away at Nate, and he turned to drugs and alcohol to cope, even drinking before school. However, he did his best to keep the details of the abuse to himself. One night in early 1998, his parents woke him up and drove him 12 hours away to a Christian boot camp in Missouri, prepared to leave him there. They took him home after he pleaded with them that he'd do whatever they wanted, but five months later, the cycle started again. On June 5, 1998, Nate's parents informed him in the morning that he was going again to the Christian boot camp in Missouri, this time to stay, after the school and workday had ended. Eric Jensen said that when he found out, the pair came up with the plan to leave town after work and camp out for a few days before moving on to California to start new lives. After school, Eric drove his friend to work, then picked Nate up afterwards so they could grab his duffel bag and guitar. Nate even discussed murdering his parents as an option, which stunned Eric. He said that he had lived a charmed and sheltered life so far, and the thought that his friend truly believed that murder was his best chance of escaping an unsavory home life was shocking. And by a sheltered life, one would have to assume that he meant sheltered from parental maltreatment, because the life he had seems like every teenager's dream. Wealthy but busy parents who let him do what he pleased. They had beer, were allowed to smoke marijuana, have girls over, stay out as late as they wanted, and spend money extravagantly. Everyone but Nate ranged from well-off to wealthy, yet the group exhibited the angsty, unfulfilled personalities stereotypical of 90s teens. Eric, who had sworn loyalty to this friend, was no different. 
In a 2012 letter he wrote to his family, he said about his teenage years, quote, I was an angry, arrogant teenage boy who had every opportunity to succeed yet could never be satisfied. Always looking for destructive ways to release the pent-up angst and anger I had no reason to even feel. I make no excuses for the boy I was. I treated my family terribly. I lashed out at my little sister whose only offense was wanting to be around me more. I squandered opportunities, quit anything that was ever a challenge, and couldn't wait to escape my horrible life. So when it came time that something had to happen, Eric had no problem leaving his old life behind to try and help his friend have a new one. Their stories have always been similar and haven't really changed. Per their plan, Eric picked Nate up from work and took him home, where they were hoping to grab Nate's things and leave. But Nate's mom was home. Eric said that he'd been really stoned and was late getting Nate from work. The pair didn't get to the apartment in time to make a clean getaway. Nate, however, had found some courage and wouldn't be dissuaded, telling Eric to stay in the car and wait, but to come up to his third floor apartment if he wasn't back in 20 minutes. At the appointed time, Eric went up and was led into the apartment by an angry Julie Ibanez, who sent him to Nate's room to wait out their family discussion. His intention was to get Nate's things together so they could leave, but he almost instantly heard Nate screaming at his mother, telling her that she would never do this to him again. They were fighting, quote, to the death, Eric told Rolling Stone, when Nate called out to Eric to bring plastic wrap, prompting him to leave Nate's bedroom. What he witnessed next was shocking, as a murder was taking place right before his young eyes. Eric remembered it as happening in under a minute. Only seconds elapsed between when he saw Nate striking his mother with a fireplace tool, then picking it up and using it to choke the life from her. She had three broken fingers, indicating that she tried to protect herself and had sustained at least 20 blows to the head. They recall that Nate handed the murder weapon to Eric, who dropped it and fainted for a moment, waking up kneeling in a pool of Julie Ibanez's blood. The pair next called Brett Baker and Troublebound embarked on a cleaning and evidence disposal mission that lasted hours. None of the physical evidence was ever retrieved. The body of Nate's mother was concealed, then moved to the trunk of her blue Lexus. Julie Ibanez was dead one day after her 43rd birthday. Eric told the Denver Post, quote, This was a situation where I was just trying to help my friend who was hurting, not really realizing what was happening. I was in a daze. I do know one thing. This is a kid who didn't have malice in his heart. He didn't know what would happen to him when his father came for him that night. I feel guilty, not so much about the murder itself, but that I didn't protect him, that I didn't save him. Nate's in prison partly because of me, that I didn't do more for him to help him escape. It bothers me that people don't understand him. It's like, if you beat a dog, are you surprised when he bites back? Now he's there and I'm here for life. It's something we're still trying to get our heads around. 16-year-old Nate Ibanez, shell-shocked, drove to the parking lot of nearby Daniels Park where he intended to bury his mother. And that's where a deputy on patrol saw him standing around 4 a.m. on June 6, 1998 next to an empty trunk with Julie Ibanez's body on the ground next to him inside a sleeping bag. The 16-year-old was charged as an adult with first-degree murder and, if convicted, faced life without parole. Brett and Eric next took off to Mexico, which Brett contended later in court was Eric's idea, carrying out his fantasy of running away. They called their dads to pick them up after staying there for one night and were arrested a few days later, charged with disposing of evidence, then released on bond to await trial. Eric had been at home on an ankle monitoring device for two months when Brett turned on his trouble-bound bandmates and implicated Eric in the actual murder. 
The DA's office stayed on Brett, making sure he testified against his friends by dangling a murder charge over his.